Hello, everybody. Can I ask you to take your seats, please? Hi, everybody. And can I please ask everyone to take their seats before we start? And um, I would just like to say thank you to everybody at FQ for allowing us to have this very important conversation today. As we know, there is over 25 wars around the world and over 100 conflicts in the world. And we need to look at the role that women can play in peace building, looking at how do we look at the security agenda. So this is a very timely and important conversation. And I would really appreciate that um, we respect different points of views and different opinions, because sometimes we hear things we don't always agree. But I would ask everyone to um, just respect different points of views. I'm joined by amazing panelists from around the world, and I'm quickly going to ask you to just tell me who you are and what you do. Thank you, Mandy. My name is Tatiana Kotlarenko. I'm an award-winning human rights expert, specifically focusing on combating human trafficking and gender-based violence. Thank you. And Anastasia Diakova, head of Lead and Enjoy in Ukraine that protect children from online sexual abuse and exploitation, and for five years, advisor to Ukrainian government on human online safety. Hi, my name is Lenora Bargil. I'm a lawyer. I'm um, a women's rights advocate for the last 20 years, and I'm a former Miss World. Thank you, Mandy and Shelley. Dr. Kanta Ahmed, I'm an observant Muslim practicing Islam, practicing medicine, and I have been um, exposing radical Islam for about 15 years as a human rights observer. Thank you. Um, Tatiana, I'm going to start with you. Obviously, you and I have worked around on lots of different conflicts, Afghanistan, Ukraine, Sudan more recently. Um, it would be really good to, for you to set a scene a little bit around the role of women in peace and security. Thank you, Mandy. Uh, 20 years ago, the landmark UN Resolution 30, 1325 was passed on women, peace and security, which clearly brought consensus on the fact that women should be engaged in peace building, but it also brought into focus issues regarding protection of women from sexual violence and conflict. Moving um, 20 years forward to now, there have been more resolutions passed. There is a clear acknowledgement that sexual violence and conflict is a major issue. At the same time, what we have seen is that sexual violence and conflict has been happening many times with impunity. We have also seen a change in how that sexual violence and conflict is happening, where the crimes are getting more violent, more brutal, and more despicable in every way possible. Um, we uh, um, have seen women step up all across the world, women leaders, women like the women that are sitting here to bring peace building onto the agenda and really participate because war and conflict, as has been recognized uh, by the international community, has a particular impact on women and girls. And one of the other things that you and I have worked on is a lot around human trafficking. And I think that people sometimes don't realize the real hidden cost of a war and conflict. That's very true. There is a direct linkage between human trafficking and conflict when women and children fleeing war are particularly impacted um, and made vulnerable all across, all across the globe, actually, with this particular issue, whether it's in Tigray or Ukraine, as we have recently seen, mm -hmm. this is a very, very significant issue. And the other issue that needs to be recognized is that when women experience sexual violence, we may read it in the headlines of newspapers, and move on from that. But survivors live with this for the rest of their life. It impacts their every days, and it impacts their families and communities at large. Thank you for that, Tatiana. One second. Excuse me, everyone. This is the only time today that I'm going to ask for quiet. So everyone in this room, there's no conversation. If you want to have conversation, move to the left or move above to the room above. We are talking about a conversation that is incredibly sensitive, and a lot of people up here are experiencing things that are very private and hard to talk about. So 
I would love for anyone that wants to have conversation to move upstairs or to, or to move to the room in the front. Other than that, everyone could take a seat or move somewhere else, okay? I just would really be grateful and appreciative. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you, Thank you Shelley, for that. And I just want to say that one in 150 people is trafficked. Just wanted people to know that as well. Um, Cantor, I'm going to come to you. Um, as a, a practicing Muslim, as you've just said, you have also worked in many conflicts and a lot of different things, and it would be really interesting to hear your points of view as well. Thank you. Yeah, I've uh, been qualified in medicine for 33 years, and I was working in the intensive care unit when September 11th happened. I was in Saudi Arabia. And as a Muslim woman, I wanted to understand how this ideology came from inside my religion, and that inquiry took me to the northwest frontier of Pakistan, where I met child Taliban operatives being de-radicalized by Pakistani female neuropsychologists and the Pakistani military. I traveled to post-ISIS Iraq and met with uh, men and women working to rehabilitate and recover the Yazidi victims of the genocide who had faced brutal uh, crimes as well as loss of almost their uh, entire male population and described as still experiencing a silent genocide now and more than 4,000 of them remain disappeared kidnapped and sex trafficked even today. Um, and then most recently, I also felt compelled to go and witness the events shortly after October 7th in my capacity as a doctor and as a Muslim who condemns the actions of Islamist jihadism, which is how I believe Hamas acted. Mm -hmm. And the work of a doctor is generally listening to a patient and keeping them company, even if we have no treatment options. And that bearing of witness, I think, is important for us to do as human beings, whether we're Muslim or Jewish or Christian. Yeah. And the and final, final point I'll say is these ideologies in radical Islam are all about exterminating the other, including the Christian woman in Karakush, in Ninenve, in Iraq, mm -hmm. burning churches, um, eliminating women, girls, babies. They do not discriminate in their hate, though the anti-Semitism I've seen is eliminationist and genocidal. And I think one of the things I would also like to ask you, Cantor, is because you have been in Israel more recently, and people probably aren't aware of this, that actually Hamas and, you know, had raped and killed Muslims, and I would love for you to just tell us a little bit about what you saw on the front line. Yes, so I also met with a, a number of Israeli Arab Muslims, civilians and military. Some of the first lives lost on October 7th were the children of Israeli Arab Bedouin families in southern Israel. I met with the fathers and uncles of four children killed in the, in the missile attack. I met the soldiers of Unit 585, Bedouin Israeli third generation IDF officers, Muslims like me, who provided an extremely strong defense on October 7th and recovered an IDF base from Hamas. There were over 162 children killed. Overflow uh, injured came to the Rambam Medical Center where the entire receiving medical staff was not Jewish because most Jewish staff had already enlisted in the military. They were Israeli Arabs and Israeli Christians who dealt with brutal maimings. And then there were, of course, Bedouin women who were murdered, raped, and defiled. Commander uh, Manzur Aramshah, commander of the Unit 585 Bedouin Tracking Unit, told me they did not hesitate to rape and violate and murder also Muslim women. Thank you for that. Thank you for that, Cantor. And so I'm going to come to you. Obviously, you have been doing a lot of work in Ukraine, and obviously we've seen, and we um, did panels here a couple of years ago when the first crisis happened with Ukraine, and myself and Tatiana have supported a lot of women who have been sexually exploited, sadly, through 
the conflict, but it would be good to just hear from some of your work and your thoughts. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, being a victim of Russia aggression against Ukraine, I'm a little bit worried, so I'm sorry in vines. But anyway, I want to start from uh, uh, von Clausewitz, Clausewitz, who tells us that the biggest mistake in war is kindness according to your enemies. And Ukrainians this far have to uh, follow international order and rules and in, uh, some protocols, but Russia bomb our civil infrastructure, rape and kidnap our children, because for Russia, humanity and democracy is just a weakness. And Russia want to show, and Putin especially, that European Union and NATO is weak, and democracy is weak, and it's not like a world players. Uh, so like a tyranny, use tyranny tools. And nowadays, Putin use it not only in Ukraine, but in democratic countries as well because uh, our Western countries are afraid to provide whole support to Ukraine to keep peace in the region, uh, because they're afraid by escalation. But anyway, these days we listen a lot from different presidents that we have to be ready in the next three or five years to full escalation in Europe. So maybe it will be better to invest now, because it's not charity for Ukraine. When we, you help and support Ukraine, it's not charity. You invest in peace in the region to protect from raping, and I will move forward to women role in Ukraine to this, uh, just to protect children from being raped in, in Europe. Uh, but together with this, there are a lot of discussion about peace. And today we have a peace panel, and we yeah. want to talk about peace. But together with this, we had 200 discussion with Russia since 2014, when they occupied Crimea and Donbass, and the world tried to have a look that really nothing happened. Let's just keep, keep peace, and we have this result. So any, any peace now will lead to this. And maybe I make a um, little like a mis uh, comment, like a last comment uh, about the role of women. Yes, please. So I really believe that there are three main pillars of victory, and I believe that we have to have victory, not peace. Otherwise, it will be a sign for the world that they can attack other countries, their neighbors, and Russia will just collect power and, uh, and uh, do against Baltic countries. We have to be clear. So three main ways is uh, integration and unions, economy and military. And in all of these parts, a Ukrainian women play a crucial role. So in integration, uh, we finally have a great news about European integration. And in Ukraine, Vice Prime Minister of European Integration leads this work, uh, Olga Stefanishina. But we are really uh, looking to be a NATO member because we are really fighting for NATO again. So let's be honest. Economy is, could, could sound incredible, but last year we had plus 5% of GDP in Ukraine, even during war. So this work as well led by women. We have Vice Prime Minister of Economy, um, uh, Yulia Sviridenko, who leads this work. But as well, it's really valuable that the world not only provide military support, but provide investment. Because a lot of small and medium business now led in Ukraine by women, because their men go to be military person. Yeah. So women lead businesses. And when you invest in Ukraine, there are a lot of territories uh, like a where it's safer to invest. And it can be small and middle business, but as well military production as well. And the last one about military, and I think it's a crucial one. Uh, in Ukraine, it's not mandatory for women to go to military and fight. But in Ukraine, 62 women, 62,000 women voluntarily decided to serve in army to protect their family and their children. So the whole nation united. And it's really like a, with the full support and dedication of uh, Europe and Western democratics who would be uh, provided to Ukraine, not to discuss here in Davos if it will still exist uh, in three or five years, what we will do with European peace co collapse. Really powerful. Thank you for that, Anastasia. Uh, Lenore, I'm going to come to you. Um, obviously, I heard you speak at the UN and it was very powerful, but... I would love to hear your thoughts of, about conflict and the role that women can play in peace. So as I, men I mentioned, I'm, I'm a lawyer and activist, but I'm also a rape victim. And I'm a, I'm a woman of faith. Without my faith, I probably won't be here. When I was 18, I experienced a horrific and brutal rape where I almost lost my life. Sorry. I'll, I'll 
I'll give you a minute, actually. It's okay. Sure. The pain, anguish, and fear I experienced is almost indescribable. Prior, prior to leaving for Miss World competition, I was sadistically raped. And despite that, I went to the competition and I was crowned Miss World. After the rape, I spent months in a state of trauma and depression, not comprehending what had happened to me. My faith and sense of calling is what helped me to survive and what brought me here. I discovered new forces and inner strength that I never knew I possessed. And I decided that I would be the client call for so many voiceless women to give them the inspiration to rebuild their lives to let them be able to scream and not to be afraid to speak. I became connected to so many women organizations and was invited to speak all over the world. I gave lectures. I spoke about the fact we women truly understand the world and its needs. I found out that this world of men, weapon and war, doesn't understand that women can work without agendas interest in politics, and rise above all this. I decided to dedicate my life to this cause, and it's been, and it's been my life journey the, last past, the past 20 years. On October 7, we witnessed the most horrible massacres, atrocities, rape, mutilation of the worst human behavior, carried, carried out by the Hamas terrorists, organization. I turned to all my colleagues, colleagues and friends worldwide as well to the leading women rights organization to expose this terrible event, certain that they will speak up and condemn this unspeakable event. And what did I discover? That there is this discriminatory approach and violence against one woman doesn't equal to violence another, as in this case of Israel. Their silence, apathy, and hibernation shocked me to the core. They even had the audacity to ask for evidence when it was all there to see. There is no need for more proof. It's all out there to see. This sexual ter terror reached a new record. They deliberately planned, everything was planned, and cannot be swept under the carpet. Hamas established a new evil strategy, openly abusing mostly the women hostages and also men, mutilating them, not in a secret in the dark. Everything was filmed. And there's still girls that are out there being raped and abused every day. Anyone that doesn't speak up against this is silently complicit to sexual violence against all women, not just Israeli women. For the first time, I really feel alone. I always felt like that as a victim I had support, that someone had my back. And now I stand here at Davos with that empty feeling of being alone, just alone. The word is silent, as not a, and not a word is being said. I cannot accept that I have come here alone carrying their blood, their torn clothes, their wounds, their broken bones, their shattered and burned bodies left behind by the Hamas with nothing left to bury. They didn't do nothing. Who can call themselves activists for women's rights and remain sil silent? The terrorists filmed their crimes and sent it with pride to the families of the raped women and to the media to celebrate their mass murder with great joy and pride. Yet, these women organizations still never got together to condemn without condition these evil crimes. Therefore, I will not be silent. I will show you what took place on October 7. I will continue my fight to protect women. 
Hamas are not freedom fighters. They are inhuman and terrorists of the worst evil kind. Despite it all, I still believe that women have the power to change the world. I really believe that. And that all these women who suffer will know that we stand with them and we fight for them. And therefore, I'm sending my message of hope to all my sisters and colleagues who believe in this cause for justice, to do the right thing and not to keep quiet because history will judge all those who remain quiet. Thank you for that, Lenore, because I think it's so powerful because um, somebody who has been in the space for ending violence against women for over three decades, for 34 years, I was one of the first people to write out and call out my feminist friends. And I was shocked because for me, I have supported all women, regardless of their ethnicity, their religion, their culture. Because if you are a feminist, as a campaigner, or whatever you are, there's people like Sophia and myself and Tatiana who have evacuated Afghans and Muslims. And at that point, I was a national hero and everything else. People wanted to befriend me and think that this was the right thing to do. And when I stood up to call out the terrorist attack that it was, and that's exactly what it was, um, people were saying, oh, you need to change your stance. And I was saying, look, we need to call out. You cannot be in a space and have this privilege in some of the highest offices in the world and say, oh, well, actually, oh, it doesn't matter about Israeli women. It doesn't matter about that. We should never have needed me to unless you're a Jew campaign. I mean, that has hurt me to my core like nothing before. I am now going to come to you, Tatiana, for a final thought. If... Um, before I go to my final thought, I think Lenore just wanted to say. I just wanted to say another one, another, okay, another okay, thing. Sorry. The history is full of unjust wars, but also full of brave and courageous women who dare to stand up and to write a different history. This room is full of such women. You are fighting to change the world, and you can rise above interest because the world needs a change. I stand here today for all women who have experienced sexual violence and conflict. Will you stand in solidarity with me? I want to let the world know that rape of any woman is unacceptable and that our bodies are not tools of war. And we have to stay united and stop sexual violence. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lenore. Um, actually, Cantor, I'm going to come to you for your final thought, actually. I will work this way backwards. Um, first of all, um, I'm totally humbled by your courage. And um, when I'm listening to your words, I am thinking about some of the very difficult work of witnessing that I insisted on doing because within about 48 hours of the news breaking in the United States, I was hearing of individuals denying its reality and saying this was not true. And I was with Dr. Hen Kugel in Israel's National Forensic Center in the morgue, looking at the remains of people that had been subjected to this genocidal violence when a Muslim queen questioned if there was truly evidence that children and women had been lost in this way. And so as, as a, also a woman of faith, this is intolerable. So many Israeli police detectives, soldiers, doctors, forensic specialists told me even more barbaric than the violence was the denial. And so your voice is extremely important and I stand with you not because I'm a Muslim committed to demolishing radical Islam, but as a human being, and you are my fellow human being. <laughs> Thank you. We will stand with you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Lenore, your final thoughts, sweetheart. First of all, uh, thank you for standing with me. I'll send this mes message to the Israeli woman. Um, they would be very, very happy to know 
that the voice heard and uh, that you are there for them. Because, um, you know, woman is a woman and we all have uh, sisters and mothers and daughters. And I believe by small steps, we can change the world, but we have to speak up. And we have to start with us women. We have to speak up because if we don't, nothing's going to be changing. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Anastasia. Yeah, we have just heard uh, shocking things from Israel. All of us have heard shocking things from Bucha and Irpin in Ukraine not uh, long ago. So in case we don't want it to happen in uh, Poland, uh, Baltic countries, other European countries, I really hope that this year will be a year of wake up of European uh, region and democratic countries. A lot of them have elections this year. So if we don't want this disaster in European countries, it's a really valuable stop to be afraid of authoritarian regime of Russia and to fully dedicate it to victory uh, of Russia. Otherwise, all these stories will be not in Ukrainian and Israel house. It will be in European house. So if Europe is ready, we can go the same way. If you don't ready, it's better to uh, invest now in victory. I want to take these last words to bring it to individuals. I've spoke to women in Mazar Sharif. I spoke to women in Mazar Sharif who experienced brutal rapes by Taliban. I spoke and heard children, a child screaming after she was raped by Russian soldiers running around with no one knowing what to do. I have spoken to families in Israel and seen also the same bodies where I was told, where is the evidence for our rape tapes not played in the era of Me Too, where women victims are still treated with disbelief and denied. So here, we need to recognize that we are not just talking about sexual violence, we are talking about individuals, women, girls, boys, and men. And with that, I would like to hand it over to you to think about the fact that these people will live with all of this, as Leonor has said, and take responsibility, every each one of us, for addressing this issue, not saying here it is again in the headlines. We do have the laws and such, but for all of us to take action on this and never be silent again. So thank you for that. And I just think... One, one, okay. Sorry, one last um, uh, observation is the fact that these rapes of girls and women were systematized, they were mass, they were part of a strategy, they also included the murder and execution of family members, the decimation of communities, this happened to the Yazidi women, yep. this has happened to the women in, in South Israel, so that if there is anyone that has survived an atrocity, there is almost no ability for them to continue, which is why we see so many immolations in the Yazidi women yeah. um, who were not able to uh, uh, o overcome yeah. this. Thank you for that. And I just think that there is people here that, you know, have got different points of view. And like I said at the beginning, you're, everyone's entitled to their points of view. And what I will say is that rape doesn't discriminate. It doesn't care what your religion is, what your gender is, whether you're able-bodied whatever you know your beliefs are so we need to know that it's used as a weapon it's used as genocide it is used for so much more and for me i'm beyond grateful to shelley and i would love for you to come and say a few final words as well and i would like to just say that um you know it's really important that we think about sexual violence it's used as a kind of and even in the workplace because women are exploited. Sometimes we've seen women who they'll say, oh, well, she slept her way to the top. And we see things that, well, people will say to me, oh, you know, oh, she's got a sugar daddy. We need to think about the language because words matter. We really have a responsibility to think about this. And I also want to say that there are innocent women in Gaza that have also experienced horrific abuse at the hands of terrorists. People in Afghanistan are facing horrendous, you know, lives 
two, three years on from the evacuations, girls are not allowed to go to school. And I'm not a Muslim, and, but you are. And the first two principles of Islam is to educate and gain knowledge. And if the Taliban is stopping you from going to school, then I'm sorry, I feel I'm more of a Muslim than they are. And now I'm going to also say that something that I heard, um, I think it was President Biden, sometimes, you know what, you don't have to be as due to be a Zionist because I believe in a two-state solution. I believe that Israel has a right to exist and I have been called out recently, but I think that this is a conversation and we need to be a voice for the voiceless and tell the stories for the people who are not here to tell their story. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mandy, for being so brave and courageous. I think... <clears throat> I, I think the point of this whole thing is this is not about humanitarianism. This is not about any of these conversations. This is about take your hands off our women. This is not about Israel. This is not about Afghanistan. This is not about Ukraine. This is not about Lebanon. I just came from the Commonwealth in London with the Queen talking about domestic violence. Why are women taking out the household and put back in, take the men out, take the women, whoever is the abuser, take your hands off our women and stop using women as weapons of war, no matter where they are, rape is rape. This is not okay, no matter where it is and what it is for, not okay. Not okay, stop. Just we need to stop and we all need to stand together and speak up, speak out, and stand together. This has been going on for a really long time and nothing is changing. And we need to start speaking up and speaking out against this. That is the issue. We are gonna have this conversation. We're gonna take a two minute break. We are gonna turn the room. We have a really special surprise for everyone. And we are gonna lighten this up a lot. We have a really special, special celebrity star that is about to enter into the room. And we're gonna do a really special surprise for everyone. So, thank you all. I know how hard this is. We are all with you in real strong support. Okay, wait for a very special surprise. Take a very quick photograph. Okay, and we're but we have to get off the stage very fast because we also have to... Later.